Good afternoon. We'll start uh, with opening statements by the Secretary General, the Foreign Minister and the High Representative, and then we'll have time for just a few questions. Secretary General. Minister Koleba uh, De Dimitro, High Representative Borrell, and Josep. It's great to see you both here at the NATO headquarters, so welcome to both of you. Um, this is a symbol of our solidarity. NATO and the European Union together standing with Ukraine. A year ago, President Putin launched his illegal war against a peaceful neighbor. The facts are clear for all to see. Nobody is attacking Russia. Russia is the aggressor. Ukraine is the victim of aggression. And we are supporting Ukraine's right to self-defense, a right which is enshrined in the UN Charter. It is President Putin who started this imperial war of conquest. It is Putin who keeps escalating the war. He thought he could destroy Ukraine and divide us, but he underestimated the determination of the Ukrainian people to defend their homeland, and he underestimated our unity. One year since he launched uh, the Russian invasion, we see no sign that President Putin is preparing for peace. On the contrary, as he made clear today, he is preparing for more war. Russia is launching new offensives, mobilizing more troops, and reaching out to North Korea and Iran. We are also increasingly concerned that China may be planning to provide lethal support uh, for Russia's war. Putin must not win. That would show that aggression works and force is rewarded. It would be dangerous for our own security and for the whole world. So we must sustain and step up our support for Ukraine. We must give Ukraine what they need to win and prevail as a sovereign independent nation in Europe. I welcome the recent announcements by allies uh, on new tanks, heavy weaponry and training for Ukrainian troops. It is urgent to deliver on all these pledges. This has become a grinding war of attrition, a battle of logistics. And key capabilities must, must reach Ukraine before Russia can seize the momentum. So, Foreign Minister Koleba, uh, High Representative Borrell and I uh, discussed the need to ramp up production and improve our procurement systems to continue supporting Ukraine. Upon Ukraine's request, we have uh, agreed uh, that NATO should assist Ukraine to develop uh, a procurement system that is effective, transparent and accountable. We have also agreed today to convene a meeting of NATO, EU and Ukrainian procurement experts to see what more we can do together to ensure Ukraine has the weapons it needs. In NATO, we have been working on ramping up production for many months. NATO sets the standards for ammunition and equipment for all allies. We have completed an extraordinary survey of ammunition stockpiles. <clears throat> we met <clears throat> with defense industry last fall and continue to engage uh, with them. And we will increase our targets for munition stockpiles through the NATO defense planning process. This will also help um, give defense industry the long-term uh, demand and contracts they need to invest and produce more. NATO has uh, had joint procurement among allies for many years. I also commend the European Union for their efforts to incentivize greater production and NATO is prepared to work with the EU on this going forward. We have seen a pattern of Russian aggression over many years. Georgia, 2008, Crimea and Donbas, 2014, and the full-fledged invasion last year. We must make clear that Ukraine's future is within the Euro-Atlantic family. When the war ends, we need to put in place long-term arrangements for Ukraine's security to ensure that Russia does not continue to chip away at European security. 
and to break the cycle of Russian aggression. So NATO will continue to stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. And we will continue to work closely with the European Union to support you. Let me conclude with this. I regret today's decision by Russia to suspend its participation in the new START treaty. Over the last years, Russia has violated and walked away from key arms control agreements. With today's decision on new START, the whole arms control architecture has been dismantled. I strongly encourage Russia to reconsider its decision and to respect existing agreements. And with that, I give the floor to you, Dimitro, please. Thank you. Dear Secretary General, dear Jens, dear High Representative, dear Josep, today we held the first high-level meeting in this new trilateral format between Ukraine, NATO, and the European Union. I think it was helpful. I think we all agree it was helpful. It was important to address most pressing security needs. I uh, enjoyed sitting down in this trilateral format, and though, although this is the first meeting that we held in this format, I already begin to regret that it will cease to exist when Ukraine will become members of both NATO and the EU. But between now and then, we agreed to work intensively to answer three questions. How to train most effectively, how to produce and procure weapons and ammunition most effectively, and how to deliver all of this to the battlefield in the most effective manner. We have to be aware of the fact that since February 2022, Ukraine and its closest partners are implementing probably the largest logistical operation since Second World War. And behind big political decisions and statements, there are millions of issues that need to be resolved. And the more coordinated we get, the sooner Ukrainian army will kick off Russian army from the territory of Ukraine, and the sooner peace in Euro-Atlantic space will be restored. This is the reason why we are standing here today. So on trainings, I thanked both the European Union and allies for their training programs. They're very efficient. And of course, I raised the issue of training, uh, of uh, launching trainings for Ukrainian pilots. Uh, on procurement and on production and procurement, we had a very in-depth discussion on that. Time has come for uh, senior diplomats and officials to get into some details of production and procurement to, be, uh, to build uh, the most efficient mechanism. And therefore, as Jens already mentioned, I appreciate that we agreed to establish a working level contact mechanism, focal points to resolve issues related to production of armaments and ammunition and cooperation between uh, and streamlined cooperation between producers, contractors, and beneficiaries. This is the triangle where things have to be smoothed and streamlined, and then everything will begin to work efficiently. The capacity to produce is there. The capacity to deliver is there. So we need coordination, coordination to deliver. And this is what, uh, uh, what, we, what we discussed today. I also asked Jens to um, uh, schedule the next annual industry forum that NATO holds as soon as possible, to hold it somewhere in spring, to bring together all defense industries, including Ukrainian defense industries, so that they connect, they, uh, they meet with each other, and they build synergies and, and cooperation. Um, finally, yes, and the last point was production and uh, trainings, production, deliver, pr huh? deliveries. deliveries, yes, yes, and logistics, and, and we dedicated a lot of time to, to logistics. <clears throat> Um, the Ukraine-EU NATO format will uh, keep working on a regular basis. There are many issues that need to be explored and, and resolved. Um, we appreciate that the Secretary General uh, will be working on helping us with building our ne effective national procurement system. 
And we will be moving forward with one goal, to end this war as soon as possible with the victory of Ukraine, which is unavoidable. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitro. Josep, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Let me start by stressing the historical nature of this, uh, this meeting. The, the three of us standing here today, Ukraine, NATO, and the European Union, standing here today for the first time in this constellation of three, it's a clear demonstration of our unity to continue supporting Ukraine, for the purpose of supporting Ukraine. We have done it since day one. Since the first day of the Russia invasion against Ukraine, the European Union and NATO have been standing together, not only in condemning, not only in the worst, in the strongest terms, the Russia aggression, but uh, working together in order to provide Ukraine with the capacity to defend itself. And today we are reaffirm the unwavering support to Ukrainians' territorial integrity and its right to self-defense. Our resolve has been stronger from the beginning, and we will continue doing so. And I think that today's discussion has been crucial to coordinate the key word that uh, Kuleva has said, to coordinate, speed up, and increase our support. It is necessary in order to make the rule of law prevail over the rule of the gun, the rule of the force. And it is the only way that Ukraine can win this war, to speed up, to increase, to coordinate better our support. Because uh, we are facing a situation where the war is showing its awful face, with bombing of hospitals, starving entire cities to death. That's what Russia is doing, instead of uh, taking a step towards a ceasefire, which is something that we are asking for. Remember, Russia is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Russia is a nuclear power. And in spite of that, it has violated its charter, invading a peaceful neighbor. And in line with the United Nations Charter, Ukraine has the sovereign right to defend itself against this unfounded aggression. And the international community, we have the right to support it. To support the aggressor is not in accordance with the United Nations Charter. To support the aggressed, it is perfectly legitimate. And Ukraine needs all the support we can provide, starting with weapons and ammunition. They, didn't, they need them more than ever. And we are looking for the ways to accelerate the deliveries from member states and to Ukraine. For that, we have a tool, the European Peace Facility, which has been working since the beginning, since day one, and altogether, member states and the European institutions has provided more than 12 billion worth of weapons and related supplies to Ukraine. We have been launching a great training program that will train about 30,000 Ukrainian soldiers by the end of the year. But it's still not enough. We have to accelerate our military support to Ukraine Today, especially ammunition, tomorrow <clears throat> with other kind of arms, in order to fulfill all your needs. And I think this meeting will provide us with a better coordination procedures in order to continue doing that in a united and efficient manner. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with Interfax Ukraine. Lady at the back then. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Ukrainian news agency Interfax Ukraine, Irina Sommer. Uh, Secretary General, what is your assessment of today's Putin threat? Uh, how serious they are? Uh, if you allow, I will quote, the more long-range weapons the West gives Kyiv, the further 
Russia will be forced to push the threat away from itself. High Representative, question for you uh, about uh, speeding up a process to deliver uh, to Ukraine. You said yesterday that decision will be taken by Minister of Defense next week, but Ukraine needs ammunition today. Can we expect that a process, I mean decision taking process will be speed up? And Minister Kuleba, do you have any information regarding what Chinese peace plan is about? Any details? What can we expect from it? Do you see possibility that China, for, from being partner uh, with Russia right now, will become an ally in this war? What kind of consequences it can lead to Ukrainian? Thank you. What we have seen today is that uh, President Putin is in no way preparing for peace. He's preparing for more war, he's preparing for uh, new offensives, and uh, he is mobilizing more uh, troops and sending in more weapons. And that's exactly why we need to step up our support uh, for Ukraine. Because it will be a tragedy for the Ukrainians, but also dangerous for all of us if uh, President Putin wins uh, in Ukraine. Um, then we have to remember what this is. This is a war of choice. This is a war of aggression. Uh, Russia decides to invade uh, a neighbor, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine, of course, has the right to defend itself. Uh, that's enshrined in the UN Charter. And, and we, uh, NATO allies, uh, EU members, uh, all of us, have the right to provide support to Ukraine. And that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, then, of course, NATO allies, we are providing support to Ukraine, unprecedented support. We, we step up and deliver more heavier, more advanced uh, weapons, and we have constant consultations with Ukraine on, on, on different types of weapons, but also on how to ensure that all the systems, all the weapons which are already there, work as they should. Uh, because we need to remember this is not only about providing new systems, but also ensuring that the artillery uh, the armor, the air defense systems, which have been delivered already, have the spare parts, have the ammunition, have the maintenance, have the fuel they need to function. And therefore, this is really a, a battle of logistics. Uh, and that's the reason why I also welcome the meeting today, where we focus on how can we ensure that we provide all the supplies and all the support uh, Ukraine needs uh, to, uh, to defend itself. <clears throat> then, of course, NATO also has another task. And that is uh, to uh, prevent this war from uh, escalating beyond Ukraine. And that's the reason why uh, we, uh, um, on the morning of the invasion, activated our defense plans and added uh, thousands of more troops to our uh, presence in the eastern part of the lines, uh, backed by significant air and uh, naval power, to send a very clear message to Moscow that NATO is there to protect every inch of NATO territory, if one ally is attacked, it will be regarded as an attack on the whole uh, alliance. So we will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes, and we will continue uh, to uh, provide credible deterrence and defense for uh, all NATO territory. So. Thank you. Uh, well, yesterday <coughs> we had a Foreign Affairs Council meeting, and we will have a defense ministers in, in some days. It's the beginning of March, it's tomorrow. And, and after a jumbo meeting, putting together defense and foreign affairs ministers. But defense is an issue of the ministers of defense. Defense remains a, a competence inside the European Union of the member states. And it's up to the defense ministers to take decisions. But we have to prepare these decisions. And we have to act with a sense of urgency. After listening to my colleagues foreign affairs ministers yesterday, immediately after, yesterday night I sent a letter to all defense ministers that we'll be receiving today, asking them to provide ammunition to Ukraine from their stockpiles and from the contracts that they have already passed with the industry, giving Ukraine priority. Because the time parameters of what is happening and what we have to do is measure it on weeks, not on months. So first thing to do is to use what we have. Second, to have more. And to have more, we have to procure to the industry. Member states have already done, many of them alone. Doing that together is better. 
And third, we have to increase the industry capacity because today the rhythm of uh, using munitions is greater than the rhythm of production. So, you know, if, even uh, if the water goes quicker that it comes in, at the end, it's empty. So we have to increase these three things. Procurement methods, industrial capacity, and mobilizing quickly the resources that we already have. This is the purpose of uh, this uh, strategic coordination that takes place, don't forget it, in the framework of a demolishing by Russia of the security system. And today there is a lot of proof of that. Secretary General mentioned Russia's announcement of uh, suspending the START Treaty is another proof that what Russia is doing is demolishing the security system that was built after the end of the Cold War. So we have to work on the short term, providing ammunition quickly. It's a matter of weeks. And we have to start thinking about which will be the future security system. But the time being, let's concentrate on the most urgent issues. Yes, we uh, had a meeting with the Chinese uh, top diplomat, our former colleague, foreign minister, uh, uh, Mr. Wang Yi. He shared with me key elements of the Chinese uh, peace plan. Uh, we are looking forward to receiving the text because this is not something that you can, uh, you know, make your conclusions on just after hearing, uh, I, hearing what this plan is about. You need to get into every detail. So once we receive the paper, we will thoroughly examine it and come uh, with our own conclusions. As you know, President Zelensky proposed his peace formula consisting of 10 steps, and we believe that it's a comprehensive, concise and efficient way forward. So uh, um, for us, peace formula remains, uh, or the invoking peace formula uh, remains a top, a top priority. When it comes to the Chinese position as such, I think there is one element uh, that uh, is common for Ukraine and China, and it's not just an element, it's a cornerstone, which is the principle of territorial integrity. So everything China has been doing and will be doing in the context of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, if we take the political rhetorics aside and look at actions, uh, should be aimed at defending the principle of territorial integrity. Because if any country of the world helps Russia to destroy territorial integrity of Ukraine, then the principle is undermined. And the message is clear. Anyone else can do that in any other specific situation on the global map, Al Jazeera. on the world map. <coughs> James Bayes from Al Jazeera. Um, Secretary General, on New START, can you tell us how worried should we all be? Does it make the world a more dangerous place now? Um, Foreign Minister, um, you clearly, as we approach the anniversary, have a lot of unity in the Western countries uh, and here in NATO. Um, but what about beyond the Western countries? What about the rest of the world as we approach a General Assembly um, vote coming up at the end of the week? What's your message to the rest of the world as we approach this, this first anniversary? And High Representative, with regard to the Secretary General's comments about being increasingly concerned about China, you've said that you've had assurances this weekend at the Munich Security Conference from State Councillor Wang Yi that they're not going to send more weapons. Have you been shown proof by NATO or the US that there really is a, a problem here? Thank you. More nuclear weapons and uh, uh, less arms control makes the world more dangerous. And that's the reason why in NATO we have worked so hard uh, to um, engage Russia uh, on issues related to arms control and why NATO allies have supported the new start. Uh, and also why I'm calling on Russia uh, today to reconsider its uh, decision to suspend its participation in the new start agreement. We have to remember that this is uh, one of the last major arms control agreements we have. Uh, after uh, Russia started to violate the 
agreement that uh, uh, banned all the intermediate range uh, weapons, the INF Treaty, uh, that led to the demise of that uh, uh, treaty a few years ago. Uh, now they are su suspending the other big nuclear uh, arms control treaty, uh, the new START, which regulates put limits on the total number of long-range strategic uh, weapons. So, uh, so this is just another example that we are moving away from uh, uh, the arms control architecture, the international rules-based order. We have uh, used decades to build step by step an agreement by uh, an agreement. So the combination of Russia violating some of these agreements, um, leading to the demise of the INF Treaty, and then walking away from uh, the new start, uh, makes the world more dangerous and just highlights the importance of uh, that we stand together, uh, all those countries that believe in the rules-based international order and believes in freedom and uh, democracy. The message, uh, first my message to uh everyone asking about the global south. I think the picture that the West stands by Ukraine and the rest doesn't is inaccurate. Uh, if you look at the results of the uh, latest resolution adopted in uh, October 2022, we got 143 votes. And many countries of, the globe, of what is called global south voted in favor of that resolution. Uh, so the situation in the global south is nuanced. It's not black and white. But you're right, more needs to be done to engage with the global south. And I think that basically this struggle for, glo for, the, for, for, the, uh, for global south and support of these countries brought the whole, this whole part of the world back uh, to, the, uh, to the top of the world, world agenda in terms of big politics not only in terms of uh, uh, resources or uh, uh, technical and humanitarian assistance, but in terms of big, uh, big political, political game. Uh, we have to continue reaching out to the Global South with a very simple message, that it's not about Ukraine. It's about the rules which also protect you. And if we fail to protect these rules, in Ukraine, then you will find yourself in danger. And that's definitely not something that you want to face. Um, I think it's very simple, and I think that uh, the more this war lasts, the more understanding there is. Yes, about, uh, about China. Well, I have to confess that uh, I had a good personal relation with the State Councilor Wang Yi since uh, a long time ago, when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain, and he was Minister of Foreign Affairs of China. And we had a, a frank conversation in, in Munich, and he was very, very much clear. I can't repeat his work, in words, that China doesn't provide arms to countries at war. And he, they are not providing arms to Russia, and they will not provide arms to Russia. That's what he told me, stressing clearly that this is the principle of the foreign affairs policy of China. Uh, and by the way, asking me, why do you show concern for me maybe providing arms to Russia when you are providing arms to Ukraine? And I had to explain the, the big difference. I had to explain uh, what is at stake for us Europeans in the war in Ukraine. So. That's what China told me. And nevertheless, we have to remain vigilant, but as far as I know, there is not evidence that China has been doing what they claim not to be doing. Deutsche Welle, NPR. Thank you. But going back to, to joint procurement issues, um, Minister Kuleba, the fact that, as uh, Mr. Burrell says, this is the first time you're standing here and you've got a war that's been going on a year um, and, and that you're only now revving up these coordination mechanisms, is this too late for you? Should this have been foreseen? How desperate is the ammunition shortfall right now as everybody's top priority? Um, and um, High Representative Burrell, how fast can you move um, on, on the EU side 
to, uh, on this proposal by the Estonians to put $4 billion in a, in a fund and make joint procurement that way, as some people say, like you did with the vaccines, to give industry the security. And uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, um, I've spoken again with industry, and they say, again, the contracts are not coming in. So I know I asked you this, this last week, but it still seems to be true, and I'm told that there is still this huge gap between what people are putting on paper, what money they're putting on the table, and what is needed. How long would it take now to scale up this ammunition production? Borrell is saying weeks. There's no way, is there? Thanks. Well, when any war begins, the first thing you do, you go into your stocks. And that's what we all did in Ukraine, in uh, NATO, in EU countries. Then, let's be frank, uh, no one expected this war would last so long. And uh, uh, therefore, at a certain moment, the situation was reached when uh, it became apparent that production has to be rolled out. And the first time we started talking about it was actually, I think, last, last end, of, end of summer. Uh, and many production lines started to work um, in order to produce ammunition necessary for, for, for not only for Ukraine, but also for replenishing the stockpiles of the allies. But yes, not enough has been done. And this is why we're standing here. This is the statement of fact. And if you ask me on any issue, had, was enough done, right, uh, to provide you with everything you need? The answer is no. If, I, if we had already won the war, and I would be standing here, I would have <coughs> said the opposite. I would say yes, we appreciate everything was done because we won the war. As long as this is not the case, it's not enough. I do not undermine efforts and personal leadership of Jens and Josep in resolving tons of issues. And I'm, I'm confident it will be years after this press conference, it will be very enlightening to read some memoirs where the role of each personality in resolving one issue or another, like tanks, air defense, and other and other matters, will be will be uh, will be revealed. But this is why we're standing here to speed up everything that is needed. And uh, you touched upon a very important issue: the connection between the producer who is ready to produce and the buyer who is ready to sign a contract. And yes, after speaking with representatives of defense industries, this gap became even more evident. But it doesn't mean that there is no political will on the side of the buyer. There is a lack of procedures and understanding of how it should all work. And this is why we're meeting uh, with defense industries. This is why we're setting up the coordination mechanism to bring everyone together. We need, we are like, you know, in the beginning of the Ford, Ford company. We have to, bring, to build a production line where everything is streamlined, where everything works to bring back to Europe, uh, to bring the situation back to Europe, where everything works as Swiss watch. That's, that's the purpose. And yes, unfortunately, it requires the involvement of people like us. I wish it could be done uh, at a technical level, but that's not the case. We need to get involved and we need to get it fixed. And that's what we are doing. Well, look, the time parameters of uh, the production of uh, warfare material in Europe today, it is still not in accordance with the urgency in the front line. It's still not. So it's a matter of a speeding up. And it can be done quickly. Because the European Peace Facility, which is the instrument that we have been using, has much more flexibility than the European budget. In fact, it is, it's not part of the European budget. It's, if, I, if I can say, it's a kind of an intergovernmental club where member states can decide among them to increase the funding available. And they have already decided. Some weeks ago, they decided to top up the initial amount of money of the European 
this facility with more than 2,000 more billions. So it's a decision that can be taken without any kind of complex mm, procedure involving the European Parliament and changing the European Union budget because it's not part of the European Union budget. It's an island managed by the member states among them. So it can be done quickly, depending on the political will of all of us, of all of them, member states. And that's what we are trying to do. But to provide the munitions to Ukraine through the European Peace Facility is nothing new. We have been doing that since the beginning of the war, asking member states, provide us with the your ammunition to be sent to Ukraine and being co-financed by the fund. So the only thing is to do it quicker at, at a larger scale. So for the industry to produce, they need uh, contracts. And that has been the message uh, from the industry all the way. And, and that's also the reason why we started to engage uh, with the industry uh, last fall when we saw that this war was dragging on and that was urgent need to ramp up uh, uh, production. Because, as Minister Koleba said, uh, uh, in the beginning we were actually depleting our own stocks, uh, but uh, then we uh, saw that uh, the, the rate of consumption um, of ammunition uh, is much higher than the rate of production, and therefore this is not sustainable, therefore we need to, to produce more. But this is not something we discovered now. We discovered this many months ago, and therefore we have been engaged with the industry and with nations for a long time. And contracts have been signed. Uh, United States, France, Norway, among uh, others. Uh, but as, as uh, uh, Mr. Koleba said, uh, Dimitro said, uh, we, need, we need to speed up, uh, we need to do more, and that's exactly why we are meeting here, to see how can we mobilize even more, how can we uh, speed up uh, production, partly by coordinating, partly by improving the procedures, because big investment projects takes time. There's a lot of uh, uh, bureaucratic work that has to be done to ensure uh, accountability, transparency, and also effective uh, uh, um, uh, contracts. So that's exactly why we are working as NATO uh, with our own agencies and our own systems uh, and our own armament directors, why we are working with the European Union, and now we now, why we also then now work with Ukraine directly and also in this group of three, and why we have decided to convene our experts to follow up and see what more we can do to ramp up production and, and, and in a more uh, in in a faster way, and also uh, why NATO has already decided to assist Ukraine uh, with uh, with uh, strengthening their capacity uh, to do procurement. So so this is one element of many steps that we are taking together uh, to ensure that we have sufficient. Uh, ammunition, uh, but also weapons to uh, both replenish our own stockpiles, but also to deliver uh, to Ukraine. The last thing is that we have also, of course, reached out to international partners uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, to see to what extent we also can help, or they can help to provide the necessary uh, uh, direct support to, to Ukraine, or at least replenish our own stocks. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, so, do, do, do.